Hola, buenos dias, bonjour. Hi, I'm Clem, and my pronouns are he, he and him, and I work at Slack as an engineer. Thanks for joining this session today where I'm going to talk about how at Slack we support long lived pods using a simple Kubernetes webhook and other bits and pieces. <clears throat> so today, after quickly introducing my team, um, I'm going to describe what are so-called long-lived pods and why we need to support them. And uh, then we're going to dive into what the solution that we came up with looks like and the different parts that it's made of. Uh, finally, we'll wrap up with a few of the limitations and possible future improvements. So I work in a cloud compute team at Slack, and I'm based in Melbourne. We have about half the team in Australia and the other half in the United States. So let's look at some numbers to give you some context about like, what we are dealing with. On a good day at Slack, we get about 16 million concurrent users. That load is spread onto some 45,000 EC2 instances. So we are on AWS. We manage about 162 Kubernetes clusters, onto which some 316 services are deployed. And we have just above 1,000 engineers. We also manage 235 chef roles. And um, although my talk today is focused on our Kubernetes compute platform, uh, we still have important applications running on our original compute stack, which is Chef on EC2. OK, so let's look at what the problem is. Well, the problem is that some pods want a long lifespan, but the nodes that they're running on are getting killed. So first, let's look at why some pods want a long lifespan, uh, and then we'll look at what actually is killing our nodes. OK, so in an ideal world, applications are 12-factor, they are stateless, they boot instantly, they scale out infinitely without any drain on the infrastructure, they are fun to work with, um, but unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. Instead, we live in a growth-obsessed capitalist society. And we have to deal with applications that are stateful, that can be slow to warm up, that can be intensive on infrastructure when they do scale out. Um, maybe they don't like to get terminated early, or maybe they hold on to some long-lived uh, web sockets or sticky sessions or things we don't want to lose. So while at Slack we do have some uh, ideal applications, those were the first ones to migrate from our original Chef Compute platform to our Kubernetes platform. And so today we are left with a long tail of unruly docs, which are applications that are hard to move from one platform to another. So this is Peach, Apricot, and Plum, my ducks. <laughs> and they are very cute friends. OK, so back to work. Let's look at some examples of applications that fit in that less than ideal category. So first, I've got batch jobs. So while today you could design a batch job that could uh, gracefully survive a restart without losing any of its work by, for example, checking checkpointing its work onto an external storage. At Slack, we have some batch jobs that are not as clever as that. And that can take a long time to run, like talking above a day. And um, if those batch jobs get killed, well, we have to restart from scratch. And people are waiting for those jobs to finish. And that's not something that we want. The second example I've got is distributed caches. So think about uh, Redis, memcached. When you want new replicas, it need, they need to um, pull some existing data from the existing nodes to warm up and get populated. And so that can be slow to warm up, and that creates a lot of internal network traffic. So if you, lose, if you lost half of your replicas on your, on your ring, then uh, you might head into a disaster there. So you need to thread carefully. The third example I've got here is the one of a Jenkins controller. So given that it's a singleton, um, you can only run one of those at a time as a pod. And so if that pod dies, then 
engineers lose access to Jenkins. So you don't want that to die during the day when people are doing that, their work. OK, so some applications want to not get killed, but why are they getting killed? Well, they're getting killed because the pods are running on nodes, and the nodes are, getting, are getting killed. And here are the systems at Slack that are killing the nodes. So I've separated those into two categories. On uh, the left side, we've got the things that we control. And on the right side, the things that we don't control. So the first thing is auto scaling group um, scaling in. So outside of peak hour, we reduce the size of our clusters to save cost and the planet. And that kills nodes. The second thing we do is chaos engineering. We kill some nodes to make sure that everything works continuously. And nodes go away when we do that. And the third thing is that we have a process that uh, kills every node that gets to two weeks old. Because that helps us roll out patches and updates. Talking about patches and updates, well, if we need to roll out an emergency security patch, um, Sometimes we just don't have the luxury to wait for two weeks to do that, so we have to go and rotate all the nodes. And that's something that we can't do anything about. That's something that has to happen. And the last one I've got here is AWS terminations. So AWS is usually pretty polite, and they send you an update that some of your instances are going to get terminated. So you can act on that, um, but you could also lose a node out of nowhere if you're pretty unlucky. OK, so let's look at the solution now. Let's look at the whole picture first, and then we'll dive into the different components that makes this solution. So we're using taints and tolerations to match pods to nodes, and then we're protecting the instances from getting killed. So taints and tolerations are a um, built-in Kubernetes feature that help you match pods to nodes. Uh, today, it's more likely that you would use something like pod affinities and anti-affinities, which give you more granular control. But for our uh, feature, tents and tolerations were simple, and that's everything that we needed. So um, it's like we decided that nodes live on for two weeks, 14 days, and that's what we base our calculations on. So in this example, we've got a pod that wants to live for seven days. So what we do is we apply toleration on this pod. The toleration is called lifespan remaining and has the values 7, 8, 9, all the way up to 14, which means that it's then happy to get scheduled on a node that has at least seven days of life remaining. And so then the nodes, we apply taints on, and the taints um, represent how many days left there is of life and is based on the uptime of, of the node. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this example, the node is four days old, so it has 10 days left to go. And then we need to go and uh, teach the systems that kill nodes to not kill nodes when they're not allowed to do, so, to do that. And we're going to talk about this in a few slides as well. OK, so let's zoom into um, how we get that taint on the nodes. So that's pretty simple. We've got a small uh, Go service that we run in each of our clusters. And it loops through all the nodes and updates the taints the nodes updated from with the right value. So in the top there, the node's got seven days left because it's seven days old. Uh, the one on the right hand side is got zero days left to leave because it's been up for 14 days. And the one at the bottom is a new node, so it has a whole 14 days to go. Right, so we applied taints on the node, but it doesn't really um, do anything. So now we need to go and tell the systems killing our nodes to understand this concept of taint and toleration that we're using and to prevent them from killing the nodes. So in the next two slides, I'll talk into details about ASG scaling and chaos engineering. But the third one in that I talked about, where we just kill nodes after two weeks, we realized that we could just retire that. 
because um, thanks to the first two ones, nodes actually don't even make it to two weeks already. So that's something we could retire. Uh, but then we're left with the things that we don't control. And so if we need to roll out a security patch or if AWS kills an instance, this is just like too bad. So in a way, this uh, is part of the contract we have with our users of this feature, that the feature isn't perfect. And sometimes something like that might happen. And <clears throat> OK, so let's talk about auto scaling. Uh, put this aside for a second and, and don't think about Kubernetes. The classic way to scale instances in an auto scaling group in AWS is by using auto scaling rules. Auto scaling rules look at the resource consumptions on your EC2 instances, so like how much CPU, how much memory is being used. And once you reach a given threshold, adds or remove nodes. But with Kubernetes, this is not, this doesn't work to do that because um, workloads in Kubernetes, like applications running, request some resources. So request CPU, request memory. And it doesn't mean that they are using what they're requesting. So you can get into this unfortunate situation where all of the resources on your cluster are being requested, are being claimed, and you can't schedule any new pods. Meanwhile, the resource utilization on your instances can still be pretty low. This is where Cluster Autoscaler comes in. So uh, Cluster Autoscaler has this like, insider knowledge of the resources that are requested in the cluster and scales your cluster depending on that, not depending on the uh, end utilization of your instances. And so a cluster to scale is a Kubernetes project that you can find on GitHub. And here I've got an extract of our deployment manifest that we use to deploy cluster to scale. There's a bunch of flags which I'm not going to go over, but I'm just going to talk about the last two ones because that's the flags we had to add to get this feature working. So the first one is ignore taint, lifespan remaining. Because the way uh, like cluster autoscaler tries to create new nodes, but if it creates a new node based on an old one, reusing that old taint, the new pods won't be able to get scheduled on this node. Um, so we just say, hey, just ignore the taint, and we're tainting the nodes ourselves. Just don't worry about that. However, any node that has a taint that is being ignored is seen as unready by cluster autoscaler. And um, because like typically taints can be used to cordon nodes or make mark them ready for deletions or things like that. So then when too many nodes are seen as unready, cluster autoscaler auto like freaks out a bit and goes like, hey, something looks dodgy here. I'm not gonna touch anything. So we have to say, hey, look like it's okay for a hundred percent of the nodes to be unready. And so then it keeps on working. So I mentioned that we're doing some chaos engineering. We have this service called kubetest cluster, and it loops over every cluster we have, and um, for each cluster, looks at all the workloads and resources that are deployed there, how many there are, in which states they're in, then finds a node that is eligible to get killed, kills the node, wait for a new node to come back up, and waits for the resources and the workloads to stabilize and look the same as before so that we know that we can scale out, that we can um, schedule pods and do all the things that we want to do. But how do we know if a node is eligible to get killed? Well, the simple way to go with about that would be to just wait for a node to be two weeks old. Then, then we know we're not breaking anything. We can kill it. Uh, but instead, what we do is we run this function over our nodes. So this function looks at the pods that are running on the given node. And unless there is a pod that has a lifespan uh, request that hasn't been reached yet, then we're allowed to kill the node. So I've got a diagram on the side here to illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say we just have one node and one pod. And when the node is two days old, we scheduled a pod that has a lifespan request of four days. For the first four days here, uh, that function will return false. We're not allowed to kill the nodes because there's a pod there that 
still needs to live for a few days. But after four days, so when the node is six days old, then the function will return true, and we're able to kill the node uh, without breaking any contract on the pod. And so we can kill the node before it gets to 14 days old. OK, so we saw how the nodes are getting tainted and then how we protect them from being killed. Uh, but now let's look at how we get the toleration on the pods. So at Slack, users typically don't deploy Kubernetes manifests uh, directly by themselves. Instead, they write a bedrock YAML config file that gets passed by our tooling chain and creates Kubernetes resources. So in this example, there's a service called Grumpy Service that has one uh, stage to be deployed in dev, asking for one replica and for a minimum lifespan of seven days. That YAML config file gets passed by our Bedrock CLI, and Bedrock CLI creates a Kubernetes deployment on the targeted cluster. So it takes that minimum lifespan field in the YAML, uh, Bedrock YAML file and turns that into a label on the nodes, and the label's called lifespan request, requested. <coughs> so we've got a deployment. The deployment controller goes and um, tries to create a pod. So the Kube server API sends an admission review request to our admission webhook. The admission webhook looks at the pod spec, mutates it by injecting all the tolerations that we need based on the label that was on it, and um, returns the admission review response to the Kube server API with that JSON patch. And so a pod gets created with the tolerations all the way from 7 up to 14. So users never have to type all that by hand. Instead, they just punch in the fields in the initial YAML file, and the magic happens. So to do that, we need an admission webhook. So I went online, and I tried to find out how, like, what's the best way today to get a, an admission webhook off the ground and deployed in Kubernetes. And I found Kube Builder, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But let's, this is like the first line in their readme. Kube Builder is a framework for building Kubernetes APIs using custom resource definitions. So here already you should start thinking that we might not be on the right track because we're not doing any CRDs, we're not controlling any resources like what we're doing is, is stateless. Like we just want to mutate requests on the flight. On the right-hand side, um, I've got the architecture concept diagram from the Kube Builder documentation. And this is probably too small to read, but I just wanted to put this up to illustrate, to show all the capabilities that uh, Kube Builder has. So we actually don't need most of that. Like all the controller stuff we don't need. We don't need to manage anything. All we need to do is the right hand side box called webhook. So instead, we went and wrote a simple admission webhook in Golang. And that worked pretty well for us. So we went and open sourced it. So you can find it on the Slack HQ organization on GitHub. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and like. Look, even if it's not something that you need or want in production, uh, this repo comes with a make file that uses uh, Docker and Kubernetes in Docker, also known as kind. And so you can, with a couple commands, just get a Kubernetes clusters running on your laptop, deploy the admission webhook, deploy pods, look at the logs, or change the code, change the validations, mutation, redeploy the webhook, and see what's going on. So what I mean is like, I'm hoping that this might have some educational value if you are not super familiar with how admission webhooks work in Kubernetes, well, maybe that's something that you want to play with. It also comes with a blog post that uh, goes into a bit more detail on like how the different parts of the codes uh, interact. Uh, if you don't know uh, the Slack engineering blog, I suggest like you should go have a look. There's some really good stuff there. Uh, especially some really solid technical articles after um, we have like serious incidents. 
Okay, so that's all the bits. Um, so we've got pods uh, getting matched on nodes, and the nodes are protected from being killed too early because we taught the system how not to do that. And so this um, lifespan feature at Slack today is used by about like half a dozen services. And the maximum value we allow is seven days, and everyone is setting that to seven. Like initially, when we talked to different teams, some people said, "Well, look, all we need is um, like one day or two days. Like, just give me the guarantee that we're not gonna that my pod is not gonna killed, be killed like every few hours." Uh, but at the end of the day, they still set seven days in the config file. So, <laughs> my we could just have had that uh, field as a Boolean in the config file, and the end result would have been the same. Make it a bit more simple, maybe. All right, so I've got a few more things to talk about uh, before wrapping up. So the minimum lifespan uh, guarantees that your pod will live for a given amount of time, but there's no guarantee that your pod will actually get killed once you reach the end of the lifespan. But some of our users actually want control over the whole lifespan dynamics of their applications. If we think back about our Jenkins controller, well, it's not really that we want the Jenkins controller to live for a day or seven or whatever. It's that we really don't want it to get killed during the day. But um, with what we've implemented so far, we can't really s set that. So we have our users uh, kill the application at night uh, to reset the minimum lifespan counter. But so that hopefully, there's just a feature that we can add uh, later on but one of the limitations that we have today. Another thing that I didn't mention is that um, we already had an old admission webhook, an admission webhook that was built using uh, Cube Builder, but it's a few years old and it hasn't been upgraded in a while, and upgrading it today to a more recent version of Cube Builder would be a lot of rework, rewriting, refactoring. And in the same um, way, like the, f the validations and mutations that this old admission webhook does are stateless too. So it doesn't do CRDs either. It doesn't do any controlling. So it's the same requirements as the simple webhook I presented to you. So that was one of the reasons why we went and created the simple admission webhook, because we thought, oh, this is great. Then we can just migrate the features from the old one to the new one and retire this um, old piece of work. But as you might know, uh, retiring old systems is hard to prioritize. And so while some of the features have been migrated to the new one, um, so for example, we validate that our Docker images are coming from our a trusted registry. Um, we still have a lot. Uh, everything that is sidecar injection is still on the old webhook. So we inject sidecars to do uh, pod to pod uh, encryption to deal with secrets and service discovery. And so that's still living in the old one. OK, and so I didn't build all this by myself. Uh, it was three of us working on the feature. It was me and Sean, who I would like to thank for all the things he taught me about software engineering, and Trisha who uh, has been a great source of inspiration. And I also want to thank Javier for his ongoing support and for how excited he was uh, to have me be here today doing this talk. And uh, those are the images I used. And thank you. Perfect. Uh, great session. Uh, so now time for the Q&A. Um, there was one question online about the slides, but they're going to be added to the uh, event platform, I think. Yeah. Um, the link to the slides, was that was the question, yeah. The link to the slides? Yeah. Uh, so the slides are on uh, SCED, yeah. so you can just download them. I did a few updates today, so I'll re-upload a new version after that. Perfect. Any questions here? OK, there. Thank you. And why, or which is the reasoning behind having two weeks uh, lifespan for all the nodes? And probably related, another question. And can you guarantee that uh, within that uh, two weeks lifespan, 
and because of um, uh, security rollout, every node will have uh, 14 days uh, day span. So, and if eight days uh, and uh, goes, let's say eight days passes, after that, if someone asks for seven days span, and uh, you will then you wouldn't be able to to schedule because there is no node available. So, how do you deal with that? Yeah, right. Um, so like the, the two weeks is, is historical to start with. So this has been um, like the cadency as to how often we rotate nodes and how often we roll out uh, patches. And this is why the maximum we set is seven days, because then it means we have seven days to kill the nodes and get everything done. Because if we let people set two weeks, then at the end, then we have to rotate all the nodes at once. And that's not a position we want to be in. Um, but uh, most of our applications don't use this feature. So from seven days to zero, then most of everything we have will still run on the nodes. It's just uh, the few picky ones that want that lifespan uh, request that won't be able to run on all their nodes from seven to 14 days. Great. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there we have one really quick hand. Thanks for, the, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a question. Services, do, do they know internally that they have uh, this many days to leave? For example, if I start my service at Slack, uh, do I know that my service has seven days? And then do your, your engineers do something about it, like the exit gracefully at seven days, and then they are just not consuming resources? or And then you end up with empty nodes? or. How do you deal with that? So you mean uh, services that don't use this feature? Uh, if, my, if my service is configured to request 10 days of minimum lifespan, then what I could do with that? Could I exit in 10 days and then stop uh, the, uh, the pod from running and just sleep? Or um, do, do you leverage that in some way? That is uh, so if your service is requesting 10 days, then after the, the 10 days, then nothing will happen right then. Uh, but it likely get killed within 10 and 14, because that's like how fast we rotate nodes. Okay. Am I answering your question? OK, so so developers don't do anything with that 10 days lifespan? Oh, no, no, no. Just no, it's just, it. it's, um, yeah, it's just a, an extra guarantee they have on like the stability of their workloads in our infrastructure. They don't, yeah, they don't have to do anything. Okay. Thanks. Great. Was there any more? Yes, this one. <coughs> Um, quick question. So I like the taints and tolerations approach for just making it very easy to see what the state of the node is. Um, has there been um, a discussion or um, an idea of using uh, custom scheduling rules uh, or writing a custom scheduler to do the, the same behavior as, as uh, done right now? Uh, not seriously. Um that could be an option we should talk about after that. And that would be interesting to know like how you might go about and, and using a custom resource definition or a custom sh scheduler to do that. Um, we had a bit of time pressure to release this. And we tried to find like sort of like the easiest way to get that feature delivered. And that's what we came up with. But definitely a custom scheduler would work. OK, great. Any more? No immediate hands, um, but you can obviously go do. Oh, there's one. Sorry, I missed you. Uh, that was a really good talk. Thank you, first of all. Um, I've, you've got a huge number of nodes to manage. So I can't hear you at all. Um, you, so the one thing I'd noticed from your talk is that you've got a huge number of nodes to manage. And with the number of long running pods, which you're trying to prevent being killed prematurely, um, I'm wondering how you measure the success of that, and how many do you know how many long-running pods are still getting killed prematurely? Yeah, we don't know. So you have no monitoring tool to sort of see how successful your approach has been? It's like, so we, well, at first we had um, debug logging enabled on the admission webhook, and so we were getting a lot of, uh, uh, like, analytical data from the logs, and we saw how many applications used the pods and what, how old the pods were and when they were getting killed. And from that like, little investigation, like that window of data we had, um, it, it, I don't have a number to give you, but it looked pretty good. 
Um, but since the logs are not debug anymore in production, and so we've actually lost lost track of this. And yeah, our telemetry story can be improved. Great. Any final last ones? Nope. Uh, thank you for a really great session. Thank yeah. you.